Um, hey, welcome everyone. I'm Chris Irway. I'm going to be talking about metrics, logging, tracing, monitoring, observability, APM, and you. And so this is uh, going into some of the details on the observability, monitoring, tracing, and APM communities, vendors, and uh, frameworks. So uh, how do I advance the slide? There we go. And so who am I? I'm Chris Irway, I'm the Chief Architect for IT Operations Management. I was a co-founder of a company called Tracelytics back in 2010. It was the first SaaS distributed tracing vendor. Um, it got acquired by SolarWinds in 2016. And before that, I did some uh, anonymity, privacy, distributed systems research. And before that, I was a parallel computing person who you know, worked on large high performance computing environments. Um, my involvement in tracing, you know, comes from the startup, of course, but also in my work with the Open Tracing Specification Council, which was this effort to get some standardization around tracing. Uh, we'll get into that later in the talk. So a lot of people talk about monitoring, observability, APM, all these buzzwords these days, but now that it's 2020, we can say uh, <laughs> in the last decade, there's been a lot of enthusiasm around monitoring. And so there's metrics, logs, uh, dashboards, alerting, and there's this whole ecosystem of open source tools that became really popular as people started to plug in applications to the internet and had a lot of you know, users and traffic and built all kinds of applications that had infrastructure, whether it's in the cloud or not, that needed to be monitored. And a lot of enthusiasm around these types of um, frameworks, open source frameworks and uh, monitoring use cases. So you might have used Graphite or StatsD or Grafana or Munin or Nagios or Logstash, and then you said, hey, great, I'm, I'm monitoring my application. And um, there was a whole community, or there continues to be a whole community of people around these topics. Uh, Monitorama was, was a conference sort of devoted to this uh, evangelism of different types of monitoring uh, methodologies. Um, the metrics, uh, there's different theories of what kinds of metrics you want to collect, like the four golden signals as written up by Google in their S3 book, latency, traffic, errors, and saturation. And these are ideas of how do we model an application's health and how do we capture application health through a set of key uh, performance indicators that we can collect from every service and then work together with DevOps IT um, engineering application teams to understand what metrics we want to get out of applications. And throughout you know, the last decade or so, there's been a huge amount of enthusiasm and focus on how do we get application telemetry out of code and into monitoring systems and as that kind of scope of problems have has grown and the number of solutions have all tried to kind of um, coexist with each other and the complexity of applications has grown there's been a lot of focus on moving from monitoring to something called observability and you might have heard this term a lot i, I would say if you read twitter or blogs or or keep up with the um kind of the the zeitgeist of, of the monitoring community they, they like to use the word observability a lot and i don't know what it means but uh seven years ago uh twitter wrote up about how they um i think they were the first to assign an engineering team or a team of uh, uh, uh at all to the idea that they are the observability engineering team and so when twitter announced that they have this goal of getting uh, observability for their infrastructure done through uh, devoted resources and calling them an observability team, they, they kind of announced the charter of that team and how what kind of tools the team uses. And, and I think this had a lot of influence on the industry. And uh, Twitter's problem they were trying to solve is this huge distributed architecture. They moved from a monolith and, and then eventually, if you look at the ring on this um, scary sun here, the the, the spokes along the edge of the circle are different distributed services that they've built, uh, microservices or services, whatever you want to call them. And then the, the lines between in going through the middle of the circle are connections and uh, I assume request throughput through the, um, through the, that they've traced between the different applications in their infrastructure. So Twitter had this huge distributed architecture and the complexity of their system led them to invent this term, the observability engineering team. And right in the charter, there's a lot of good um, formative background here on what it is that observability could be described as. And so 
the the goal of the observability engineering team at Twitter is to provide full stack libraries uh, and services to collect infrastructure metrics, application metrics, um, and help support root cause investigation into distributed systems called traces, how to alert, visualize the um, infrastructure and the metrics, and then also be able to aggregate application logs. And so they define these four pillars of observ observability, and that was monitoring, of course, the dashboards, alerts, and visualization of the monitoring data, uh, and also a distributed systems tracing system that can collect trace data. We'll get into what does that mean uh, later. And then log aggregation, and that's you know a pretty classic use case. So monitoring, observability, the other term that people like to use when they understand why their application is slow is is APM. Oh, Zipkin. Right. And so the the way that Twitter designed their tracing system was uh, custom to Twitter, but they eventually open sourced it and they released their instrumentation libraries as a system called Zipkin. And Zipkin was one of the first or was the first open source tracing system that gained widespread support uh, throughout the 2010s. Um, it's got uh, basically a way for applications to report what they're doing and then to pass context from one application to the next or one service to the next so that you can see from a diagram like this one uh, that the request came into the top level uh, web cluster, went to a second web service, and then some memcache queries occurred and some other service uh, was called and then it made some database queries. And the idea of uh, Zipkin was just to unify all of the application code that needs to be um, involved in reporting events and reporting uh, activity that's going on inside of the application and then instrument the um, RPCs, the protocols between systems. They were using the Thrift protocol, but basically to watch every time a service talks to another service so that you can kind of trace through the system. And we'll talk about this more in the future, but the the this was really influential in the community in sort of setting a, a path for other companies to follow on what it means to observe their applications. So there's a whole other uh, paradigm of application performance uh, that's got this industry term called APM. A lot of people say what APM stands for application performance management or monitoring. Actually, Gartner calls it application performance monitoring, but I think management is probably more appropriate. But in whole, it just means why is my application slow and what's going on with the infrastructure that's and the code that's impacting the, the user's experience, right? And so Gartner had these this foundational definition of APM in 2010 around end, year, end user experience. And that's what are the browsers, what are the users experiencing from their point of view? And then transaction profiling, that's um, what are the different services and databases and infrastructure? How are they impacting a specific request or a, in this case, maybe a web request and how, as that web request is executed, how does that transaction um, how is it influenced by the performance of the code and the infrastructure? Application to component discovery and modeling has to do with the idea of understanding the, um, the different dependencies in your application and how they are talking to each other, what, what databases they're using, what types of uh, cache servers and RPCs and external um, dependencies they've got. And then this idea of deep dive monitoring or tracing is, appears in the 2010 as well as the 2018 definition. And really the only difference, if you squint your eyes between 2010 and 2018 was the introduction of this word tracing in an explicit way in the, in the most recent definition of APM. Um, so you've got an application, you wanna understand why it's slow and you've got some code. So on the right hand side, you've got this function in pseudocode here. It's not a real programming language, but um, it says run important query. It's a function that makes important queries. <laughs> and you want to know what's going on. How, how is this going to impact the health of my application? So the monitoring community would say, you need to instrument this code. You need to add some hooks to various open source or vendor frameworks, whether they're maintained by your internal observability team or you're using something off the shelf or using a vendor framework. The goal is that you need to call some kind of metrics or logging or tracing SDK to get the performance of your application out of this piece of code. So you might start by measuring, uh, logging whenever an error occurs. 
you know, this is probably the, one of the more important things to know is that you tried to do something and it failed. And so in this moment, you're adding a log call to uh, say, hey, the database failed and uh, here's the error for that query. You might also want to know how frequently that's happening. Uh, that'll make it easier to show a dashboard or a chart or an alert on the, the frequency of database errors. And then once you've done that, you might also want to count how many queries are being executed overall. So you can say things like, oh, 10% of our queries are failing. Um, and once you've, you're starting to count the query throughput, you might also want to count measure the query latency. And so in this moment, you're getting a, a timing for the query, and then you're adding it to this metrics uh, abstraction called a measurement. And uh, a counter is pretty easy to understand. It, it, it calculates throughput of a certain activity. A measurement is an aggregation where you might want to report um, latency. For example, you might want to know the average latency or the P95 latency or the median latency. And so a measurement is an abstraction where you could just report a single latency and whether the backend uh, infrastructure is calculating aggregating the min and max or P95 or histogram of all latencies ever observed. This is a, a indirection point where your observability team or your open source or vendor framework can decide how to aggregate these latencies to show you the, the data later. And then finally, you might also want to log what was going on for debugging purposes. Um, you might want to know what the query was that caused the error or what the query was that was slow. And so now I've involved at least two different um, observability or, or monitoring paradigms, logging and metrics, in an effort to try and debug and diagnose uh, application performance. Great. So this is a lot of work. Uh, as you can see, I had three lines of actual logic, and I've got one, two, seven or eight lines of instrumentation code. So this is unpleasant for the engineering uh, team, definitely to maintain all this stuff. So the other approach would be to take an automatic instrumentation library. And, and those are often available from APM vendors where they're adapting techniques like App Optics, where we're adapting techniques of bytecode mod modification, or we're interrupting function calls. We've got some kind of middleware or um, bytecode library that's going to catch calls to the database and then measure the performance of the functions and calculate all the statistics and the, the throughput and the latency without any kind of manual intervention. This is just something that you drop a library into your system and all of a sudden we're, we're observing your code as it's executing and we're understanding what queries you're making are slow and we're reporting for on, on your code's behalf some kind of report or charts or dashboards of, of where the queries are occurring. And so this is sort of the holy grail, grail for observability. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, so I have a question. Sure. Uh, so what happens if I don't have control of my stack, I mean, or I have a partial right. control of my stack. Here's okay. I have the code. I have the coders. We can write whatever we want. But what happens if in the middle I'm using I don't know Oracle or what else, and uh, you know it's a black box for me. Yeah. Um, so for black box. Um... For for a lot of our uh, black box services or black box applications, you could, for example, use our Java or .NET uh, profiler, which would automatically instrument compiled bytecode, for example. And so you'd see performance results from code that you ne didn't necessarily don't necessarily have to maintain yourself. And so that's a way that you can perform black box APM instrumentation. For use cases like Oracle. Um, there's tools that can look right at the database and understand the performance or examine the um, communication to the database. And those are um, those are tools like our database performance analyzer and database performance monitor product. And those two products look at the database and the queries that are executing at the protocol level or by um, getting statistics out of the database about all the queries that are executing. And that's, uh, that's another important piece of APM that we also have solutions for. But... Um, don't require any kind of application code changes. Okay, so, but then it's not integrated. I mean, it's two different steps that I have to take. I mean, one is, yeah. one is the rest of the system. And I do not have a tool that gives me, you know, a complete view. I mean, black box plus my code. Yeah, I think the, um, the integration between your code and... Uh, so if your code is talking to Oracle, then 
and you're able we're able to use one of these automatic instrumentation libraries we can see the the queries that are going to oracle without modifying anything that's kind of the promise of what i'm talking about here with automatic instrumentation if you didn't even write the code and you all you know is that it's using oracle then one of our tools for database performance is going to be able to solve that problem but typically um You've either got visibility on one end or the other. And so I think they both kind of hit two different use cases um, depending on what you do control and what you what you can modify. So I, I think in the case where you really can't even look at or see the, or modify the code and you don't even have the ability to drop in one of these automatic libraries, the, the database performance um, monitor and the DPA database performance analyzer are going to be your best bet. Okay. All right. can, I, can I just ask that... Um... Sure. You know, it, it, the, the slide that's currently being shown, is that actually mm -hmm. an example of how your product is working or should we just skip to that because that's the more important bit to us? Yeah, I, I so yes, later in the presentation, I was planning to say, hey, and this is something we can do for you automatically as well. But, you know, that's kind of the goal of APM and a lot of these application frameworks is to tell you what's slow without you having to do any work. Yeah, and that's kind of the... Um, and that's the difference between manual instrumentation and automatic instrumentation. In the manual instrumentation use case, you're, you've got to sort of hand curate exactly what you want to report. And in the automatic instrumentation, there's sort of magic middleware or magic uh, bytecode modification or magic libraries that, that can um, do all this for you without any modification of code. Uh, to get more practical, uh, mm -hmm. obviously, if I have compiled C code or compiled Golang code, there's nothing you can do. But if I have Java or PHP or Python or Perl or whatever, can you, for example, uh, instrument the HTTP requests that this thing is making to another microservice in my network? That's right. Yes. And that was the final slide. Uh, yeah. PHP, Python, .NET, Java, uh, Ruby, Node.js, um, C Sharp, right? These are all languages we can automatically instrument. And, um, and yeah, that's one of the, the, the benefits of using a vendor and app optics is that you get all this sort of out of the box. This is, and the HTTP instrumentation basically comes for free. Hey, Chris. Hey. Quick question and then we can move on. Oh sure. Um, the uh, so so as you're watching these these queries and that now hopefully all the code that's being written, especially in containers and all that stuff. Let's assume that some are some of the code is already in version control. Let's say that 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 data already the uh, the code is actually in version control, and they released you know an update, and all of a sudden APM is saying, hey, this stuff is slow. Does APM, and you may get to this, and it's just something that popped in my head as, as we're going through this, do you guys actually capture the diffs of the code before and after without actually telling it to do that? Meaning if, if let's say for the example that someone does not have their code in version control for whatever reason, can you mm -hmm. say, hey, this query is slow now, here's what it looked like before, and can we do a compare and contrast on mm -hmm. the diffs between before and afterwards. Does that make sense? Oh, sure. Yeah, no, that's definitely, um, yeah, so the diffing of time is something we support and is, is you know, if you know the release went out at a, yesterday and you want to compare yesterday's performance today or one week ago to this week, that's something that, that we can support. We can sort of overlay lay the two performances and then you can look at individual transactions from before and after the release. You can also annotate the charts and graphs, and I'm sure Adam's going to go into this okay. with the specific points that new code was released. However, um, being able to know the actual uh, source code, especially, is not something that we support and nor do any sure. uh, vendors that I'm aware of because the, well, first of all, it's very sensitive to see your source code. And sure. then second of all, it's um, it's not always um, visible and it's not something we can just kind of provide signature. But what we can do is integrate with your release system so that when a release goes out, you can create an annotation that makes it easier for the DevOps team and IT teams to, um, gotcha. to see, oh, this happened and then this bad performance occurred. So, oh, the release is the reason that the charts all went you know, gotcha. crazy. So you're doing time series database type transactional things yeah and also then there's this um and adam will go into it in the demo but there's okay, cool. um, yeah traces and uh, performance analysis as well okay cool thank you oh no problem so uh going back to the example right and so this um this query was slow <laughs> and i'm using logging and metrics 
And in this scenario, I'm not doing any work, but I'm at least getting some kind of performance information out of it. And so we've been talking a bit about tracing. I haven't really dived into that yet. And so now I'm going to explain what is tracing and why would you ever care to use it? And so you might have an application where you just have a load balancer and a couple of application servers in the database, or you might have a slightly larger application where there's several a whole bunch of application servers and a few databases and a couple of balancers. And maybe all of those uh, servers are running different applications written in different languages with dependencies on each other that end up at different databases or cache, cache servers. So the idea of tracing is to give you some context that along the request path, a certain uh, transaction went through a set of services and depended on a set of um, underlying dependencies, in this case, different types of database servers or downstream service calls. And while in the single service tier um, use case, it might be kind of easy to see in a single log what happened for the path of a single request. Once you've got several different services written in different languages, all working in concert to service a single transaction, it's kind of hard to jump into the logs and just see, oh, this happened and then that happened. So the idea is that when a request comes in from one of your users, the trace ID is attributed uh, right away at the at the first layer, and then is passed along. Uh, a, a unique identifier is passed along through each of the application tiers that rec uh, services that request. And so, if you have a transaction that goes through um, one service down to one code path, and then the results are returned, and then it goes down to another service, you might say, "Oh, look, there's a lot of database activity going on that's causing this." Um, database to go red, it's overwhelmed and it's got so many queries coming in, there must be something going on there. And you might look at the services that are immediately talking to that database to try and understand what led to that request, uh, what led to that database being overwhelmed with the traffic. But the answer might really lie two layers up where there's a decision being made by some upstream service to forward requests for a certain code path or certain types of transactions that are actually, the, the real decision is being made two layers up not even talking to the database, where it's sending some fraction of traffic through this code path that leads to service A, talking to service B, and then overwhelming your database. And unless you have some kind of context of tracing, you're never going to see that grandparent service talking to its dependency then onto the database and understand, oh, actually, maybe there's some cache I can put in place at this higher level to avoid having to go so frequently to the, to the database and overwhelming it. And so that's kind of the goal of tracing is to understand by the um, propagation of request context, the unique identifier that attributes all the activity going on while the request is being served so that you can answer questions like who's talking to the database from the, from the transactions point of view. Um, and so in uh, back to that toy example, where we were trying to understand the database performance, now we've added a bit of a, now we've added an upstream service that's talking to the user's browser. And so we've been running inside of this important query service. We're running the function, run important query, and we're overwhelming the database. And certain types of transactions are resulting in bad database performance. So here we want to do everything we've been doing around measuring the latency of those queries and the frequency of them and how frequently they lead to errors. But we might want to get a little bit extra information into those metrics. So there's this concept of tags or dimensional metrics that's in most uh, frameworks for time series metrics. There's some way to introduce extra dimensions. So we've got this latency metric, and then we might want to have a dimension on the database host itself. Let's say you have three or four databases, you want to know which of them is slowest, and this will give you a nice chart of all the different um, latencies, average latencies across each of the four database hosts, for example. And that's just one dimension you might want to explore while trying to understand which database is slow. But then there might also be um, dimensions based on the uh, request context that you'd also want to introduce or understand that would help you understand uh, database latency. So actually, most of my requests are slow when this particular URL is being uh, addressed to the query service. So maybe the URL is called update very slow thing. <laughs> and that URL update very slow thing is causing slow database performance and it's happening 100 times a second. But that other call to get very quick thing is not causing very much database performance uh, issues at all. And unless you have this dimension that includes the URL, for example, 
coming into this service, you're not going to see that chart or understand that um, the the breakdown of of query performance and query throughput by URL without that extra dimension. And so in the context of this one important query service, it can see the queries it's making and it can see the URLs that are coming in. So it can do everything it needs to do without any, any tracing right now. The request context of the incoming request and the query that's going out is all the information it needs to, to calculate those, those, um, those metrics and report those. Hey, go ahead, yeah. You're sort of assuming through um, what you're presenting to us that the underlying infrastructure is delivering a predictable level of service. So how are you going to integrate um, inconsistencies from the infrastructure against the, um, or at least correlate them against the issues you see within the application? Oh, so you mean the, um, you're talking about the CPU and memory and the, oh, the hosts network, themselves? MC, I could have storage yes. latency. I could have all sorts of things that could have an impact. Right. I could have downstream stuff like I could be, for example, replicating data to another location and I could have uh, a, a additional latency on that replication task, which isn't necessarily yeah. directly exposed to me as a, as a user. That's true. Yeah, no, um, the infrastructure is, you know, the, at the end of the day, database isn't slow because it decided to be slow. It's the infrastructure or the network or something that's some resource is being saturated, whether it's the network resource or CPU or memory resources. So at the end of the day, most bottlenecks result, result from some resource that's being saturated in the infrastructure. And you're absolutely right that unless you have additional information about what's going on in the infrastructure and which of those resources are being saturated, this is um, the impact of that saturation on the application performance is important, but it's not the whole story. And so you need to be able to look at either charts side by side or have correlated views that show you the, um, the and back to my example, that show you the CPU or memory usage or network or disk IO on the, in my little red example, the, the saturation of the database is a symptom of the application behavior that is an important clue as to what's going on. And so now I'm trying to understand from both the application code as well as the resource and infrastructure information, what it is that's causing this, um, this, this saturation on the infrastructure level. So you're never gonna be able to get what you want just from writing a bunch of code into your services, right? There's always gonna need to be these uh, important infrastructure plugins and monitoring for, for, for at the host level or at the, the pod level or at the, at the resource level. Let me just, um, if I can, just add one little bit mm -hmm. to that. And that's the sure. idea that if you were writing an application that um, was, or say, say a SQL query that was functionally very complex and um, your Oracle uh, platform or whatever it, happened, whatever it is you're running it on can't actually break it down to be able to use the, um, the parallel processing of the platform you're running it on. So what it does is it just defaults to single thread. Unless you can identify that something like that is happening, you might think that your, um, your server or your platform is performing really well because it's using very little resource. But actually, mm -hmm. the application itself is, is misunderstanding how to actually interpret the query and single threading it as a result. So how would you pick up things like that happening? Right. And so in that scenario, the, the tracing system and all this application level information is really only going to help with the diagnostics and debug root cause analysis use case where you need to find the slow queries and be able to highlight exactly how frequently they occur, what types of request traffic causes them to occur. So you might see from your database performance tool that this query is overwhelming the database, but unless you can trace it up to the code paths that are leading to that query to be made or the request traffic the types of user traffic that caused that query to be made, your engineering team might not be able to fix the issue without that type of um, working in tandem with the, the database performance information. Okay. Cool. Yeah, and so th this is all intended to work together with that with the with the infrastructure monitoring because. Um, yeah, like you said, the interplay between the resources that are being depended on, whether they're database resources or, or network or I.O. or disk or memory or CPU, that they're all, in, in, they're all influencing the behavior of the application as well as being impacted by the behavior of the application where some dumb code that didn't use a cache is causing the database fall over. And unless the engineer can understand that that's what's happening, they, um, they're going to be out of luck with, without that type of additional uh, visibility. So in this example, again, the, the, this is an engineer sort of trying to understand 
oh, I, I, I don't understand why my queries are slow, which URLs might be causing the query to be slow. Or they might be saying, hey, uh, are my get my get requests all seem fast, right? Is that true? And then they might want to report, oh, okay, maybe my posts are the reason that the database is, maybe all the data queries that are coming from post requests are actually real slow, but the get requests are really fast. And to validate that theory, you would need to put the get versus post uh, HP method into the dimension that you're reporting, right? And this might enable some diagnostics around um, slice and dice use cases where, oh, the important query service fails whenever you try to update a row or when there's too many updates or the frequency of post requests is too high. And this, you wouldn't be able to even to start to theorize about that unless you had this connection between uh, query latency and query throughput and the, the method and the status, I mean, the HP method that was used. And Is so, there any chance okay. that you would uh, get these dimensions automatically with your add-on yes. libraries? Yes, you beat me to it. You, that was that's the reveal, and yes, but I'll I'll keep going through the, <laughs> the exercise because um, yeah, because yes, you you definitely would get that for free, and I'm trying trying to sort of highlight the complexity of the number of different questions that you're trying to get answered and how some of them might not be predictable. You're not going to go to want to add every single dimension individually to your code just so you can get URL reported and method reported and the database host reported. You know, that's a lot of work to basically in advance preordain, you know, that, oh, I'm going to need to know all of this, um, all these different breakdowns on my query performance by X, Y, and Z. Um, it would be nicer if you didn't have to have the application engineering team do any of that. Um, the next slide. So now this gets into um, the, the, the the tracing. And so here, the, the attribute that I want to understand my database performance on is not a, the URL that came into my important query service, but it's the URL that the browser used. So let's say they go to their profile page and then they go to the checkout page. And the checkout page is where the queries are really slow. Um, the important query service doesn't know that 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 the, the that the front end is servicing a checkout request. It just knows that the front end asks us to run this certain query. So unless the front end service can communicate to the query service that this database activity is happening as a result of the checkout page versus the profile page, the the metrics that are reported by the query service can't be attributed to different user activities. And so this really gets to the the point of tracing is that there is some kind of request context that's forwarded from the front end service to the query service that says, hey, this I'm calling you to query the database, and it's because I've just been asked by the browser to load up the checkout page or the profile page. And so that dimension can't be added by the query service without this piece of information coming from the front end service. And so the propagation of request context is, is the set of things that you might want to know from one service to the other. And similarly, you could try to propagate every piece of dimensional information you want to know from one service to another, but you'd easily overwhelm the number of things that you want to tell the query service to report dimensions on. And so maybe you want to know that whenever the user makes a post request, the database query performance is slow. But when the user makes a get request in this example, it's fast. You, you wouldn't be able to check track that unless the engineering team went and added all these metrics from the propagated request context. And so the goal of the tracing system, and now the programming example got really complicated, but is instead of forwarding all of these features as um, as a context with a whole bag of values saying, here's all your dimensions. Instead, just forward a trace ID and then leave it up to the tracing system to answer questions about, oh, this database query came in and upstream, uh, this particular upstream URL or this particular upstream method was what caused it. Um, now it's the job of the tracing system to take all of the spans it sees happening in the system and answer any question like, oh, does this database query happen more frequently because of this upstream activity? And so now we've gone from a sort of a metrics-based methodology to this trace-based methodology where, where metrics and are attributed to requests, not to, um, and transactions, not to specific uh, uh, services. Or the, the the context within 
which the metrics are reported are all within this request context. Um, so <laughs> the Venn diagram of things that you could report include metrics and events, right? I've, I've only been talking about logging things and reporting metrics. And so tracing isn't a type of data in itself. It's just a way to add this extra flavor of request context to your metrics. So instead of reporting a metric in the context of this specific database, you can say, oh, I bumped the count while this transaction was being served. Tracing system, you figure it out. You show me all the dimensions. And so the request context automatically gets attributed to the metric or the log message and then shows up on one of those trace diagrams or gets aggregated into some kind of um, tracing system. And it and this is sort of what Zipkin and the open source tracing world and APM vendors like Aboptics do is we take request context and we apply it to your monitoring information so that we can answer these types of questions about user behavior and its impact all the way down the stack to the lowest levels of your of your application code and your database performance. So, so I have a quick question here. Sure. Um, uh, it's just, you know, after all this um, uh, explanation, I mean, question starts popping in your head. So I was just wondering, a lot of that that we've discussed so far is based on code and obviously automatic tracing and all that. And they typically rely on metrics, response times, and all those kind of things, and which stage at, of the code is taking how, what amount of time. Um, but in the cloud environment um, or, or some other applications as well, you see that sometimes microservices or other um, uh, even software components um, also interact based, so, so they are decoupled and they're based on messaging. So response time actually is based on messaging. So individual components mm -hmm. might be working exactly fine, but because messaging is not as responsive as it should be, uh, and it's, the problems can vary, how well do these tracing mechanisms then work in such an environment? Um, yeah, messaging paradigms. Uh, yeah, messaging paradigms are important, and often when you're trying to understand the performance of a messaging paradigm, you might or a message processor, you might be interested in just the performance of that individual processor, and maybe instead of if the messaging processor is sort of completely decoupled from the user activity because it's they the user did a action and it's a fire forget and then there's some offline processing to i don't know calculate their their health or tally up something often the performance now you're trying to focus in on isn't trained on a very specific the user isn't waiting anymore right the user's told you something and it's up to you to go and process it and understand it. So now instead of trying to understand performance from the lens of the user, you're trying to understand performance from the lens of the offline processing. But it, the, the problems are still the same because the throughput of that processing is determined by the latency of the ability of how quickly you can. So if every message you process takes 200 milliseconds, if you can get that down to 100 milliseconds, you can save you know twice as much money on your Amazon bill. So I would say the the, so, so the point I was making was that sometimes can that response time, without being anything wrong with the messaging yeah. system or individual components, it can be delayed by other factors as well. And that's that's why I was asking a question that there right. isn't a problem in that case. Um, it's just that, you know, are we monitoring using the same mechanisms or is this something special? I think you are monitoring using the same mechanisms, but instead of um, one thing, you're monitoring two. You're, first, you're monitoring the user's experience still using what I said, the request that comes in, how quickly can you get a response to the user? And then there's the second component you're monitoring, which is how quickly can I process the offline, each of those individual requests uh, off of my message queue? And that's the person waiting in that scenario isn't the user, but it's still a very important thing to track because there might be a whole set of services that are involved in processing any specific message. And then all of your dashboards and charts would be about this, um, this, this, uh, the, the, the per message throughput or the per message latency. And, and so that's not impacting the user, but it is impacting your budget and your, and your ability to, you know, scale. So those are, without the user, the performance is still important, I guess. So you can still start a trace when you process the message and end the trace when you finish processing the message or start a transaction, for example. Okay, so let me rephrase that. Sure. How do we know it's not the network? How do we know it's not the network? Well, it's, it, um, so it, to understand if it's the network, uh, yeah, I, I think you will definitely see it on the, um, I have to go back a few slides, but in the, 
because I don't have a good diagram, but the um, in the Zipkin example, you might see a big gap in between two services communicating, and that might tell you it's the network. Um, you might see that the observed performance from the client is latency is very slow, but the observed performance from the server is that latency is very fast. And so that wouldn't make sense. You'd say, well, gosh, there, what's in between the client and the server? It's the network. And so um, certainly network, network charts are gonna help, Like you wanna be able to overlay charts about network throughput and network performance on top of your other performance charts, just like you'd want to overlay CPU and memory statistics as well, because all of this application observed behavior is meaningless without the infrastructure metrics underneath them or alongside them. So you can track each request from both ends, the client and the server end, and then compare the two. Yeah, that's right. And that would, that would lead you to, um, yeah, to, to be able to eliminate or rule out or, or, or not the, the network's impact on the, the communication between two services. Last, last slide on tracing uh, or on how we do it. So the, um, so like I was saying, request scope is not an, a type of data in itself. It's just a way to add this extra secret sauce to your existing metrics and logging and events that are emitted so that you can stitch them all together and understand everything that's going on in your system and then come up with new aggregations that say, hey, this user from Georgia <laughs> clicks this button, all my users from, from this country or state or region clicking this very specific button using this type of browser are causing this type of downstream database activity. To be able to answer questions like that, uh, where, where you're attributing, um, where you're trying to filter on attributes all across the stack, this is, this is the kind of thing that, that the, the tracing system is designed to provide. And under the hood, an individual trace looks like this to us. It's a whole stack of um, uh, spans. I've colored the spans here so that each of the events of when a certain piece of your system starts uh, working on the request and then finishes is, uh, is, is a span. And then we're basically collecting all these events. And as you can see, the request context is being propagated via the arrows from one service or functional unit to the next. And so it's our job to stitch this all together and give you the throughput for your Postgres to performance or the throughput for your MongoDB. You don't need to know anything about this stuff. We'll just tell you, here's how slow your MongoDB queries are. Um, slice and diced by the Node.js uh, attributes or the Nginx URL that came in. Chris, and that's kind of, yeah, go ahead. How do you work out um, what is good compared to what is bad in those numbers? And secondly, yes. how do you work out which ones are on the critical path to actually slowing down your transaction? Because some of them might be incidental, you know, like mm -hmm. side logging of a, of a transaction. So how do you work out what's on the critical path and what needs to be actually worked on? Um, so good versus bad, that's, that's very tricky. Um, we have, uh, certainly steady state for performance is, is, is something that we can help you understand. And then deviations from that steady state is something that you can observe or, or, um, or, or monitoring tools are designed to help you understand, but, but very often good versus bad is set by business level objectives, right? So if you say, I want to make sure all my, my uh, user requests are served in less than three seconds, or you have some kind of scoring system in place, those, those SLOs are going to be externally set. And good versus bad might just be as um, looking at a chart and then and, and seeing that performance went up really bad since the latest release or because of some infrastructure change that occurred the day before. Uh, what happens if, what happens if um, you know, you're, you're looking at something that's a gradual um, decline yeah. of also six, six, six months, and it's related to the fact that you've loaded you know, another 10,000 users on the system, or you know, you've taken another 50,000 orders, and really, actually, what you should be doing is cleaning out some of the older historical records or archiving or doing something. How are you going to see mm -hmm. that over time? Yeah, those types of um, correlations or relationships are... Uh, so the, that, that, the, the kind of, um, the monitoring in the monitoring use case, you would need to build some kind of dashboard or correlation between those two, uh, your exploration of the metrics would let you find the relationship between, um, for example, increased throughput and increased latency. And the goal of all of this monitoring is to help you understand 
when the orders do go up and the average latency increases is to diagnose exactly which um, interactions with your infrastructure, like database queries, are the are the largest contributor to that increase in latency, right? So you would see throughput go up on one chart, and right underneath that same chart, you would see the fraction of your application response time that was due to different parts of your of your service. And so you would probably also see database queries latency go up along with it, and that would tell you, oh, it's, it looks like my database isn't scaling very well because orders have gone up, but so has the total time in my application response times due to database latency. And so it's really just trying to, it's our job to show you those key contributors as well as the throughput so that you can understand that, that um, increased load is leading to delays because of this and we want to be able to show you whatever that thing is as as soon as possible with a in our case with a stacked up bar chart or a stacked area graph um which again adam is gonna i think go into in the, in the demo cool um so a little bit about this world of tracing so um just stepping back so this is some the, the the whole idea of tracing is something that became popular with the Twitter blog post, and then a lot of open source people started getting excited excited about it, and then large large uh, cloud companies and and large infrastructure companies started deploying more and more Zipkin and other tracing systems. Um, Uber uh, went big with their open source tracing system called Jaeger recently, and uh, so in 2015 there was this project called open tracing that started and the goal of open tracing was to kind of unify all of the application library gunk work that you would need to do into one single api that was vendor neutral and this was a neat idea because until then every open source or vendor or apm vendor had a different sdk that switching from one to the other made it very difficult to um to you know, to rewrite everything and similarly the uh the goal of Open Census from 2018 was to provide an SDK for not just tracing, but also metrics and logs. And it came from Google in 2018, and then Microsoft joined the Open Census project uh, later that year. And so Open Census was important because they looked at the whole problem of telemetry as involving not just traces, but also metrics, logs, um, errors and and other types of telemetry signals and so that kind of widened view of observability that the programmer needs to do as involving more aspects i think took took got a lot of excitement and so this past year um the open tracing and open census projects merged and so that that was a big improvement in the in the open source world because now all the vendors and open source uh, implementers can just worry about this one winner of the of the SDK contest. And so one of the things that's coming from Open Telemetry is that a whole bunch of vendors, including um, SolarWinds, are involved in uh, this project of uh, unifying the efforts of manual instrumentation as well as uh let's say you have a library like um a, a java framework for um web web development and the that open source framework themselves let's say it's spring um spring mvpc it might come with its own built-in support for for open telemetry so that it's curated by the library authors themselves and without a common sdk it's very hard to get the framework authors from the open source community working together with the apm vendors as well as the open source people and that's that's something that just happened last year and it's very exciting and they have now put into their sites the idea of doing some automatic instrumentation like i've demoed for you before with um for Java to start, but the open telemetry is still a way to write, you know, that kind of complicated code of bump a metric, report a count, start a trace, do all this stuff. And and so open telemetry and open census and open tracing all have this kind of common goal is to serve this um, pretty low level function of having uh, a way for a common SDK or a common API to be shared by lots of different vendors and implementers who want to be doing this instrumentation. And so the question 
for the typical um, engineer might be, well, what do I got to do? I don't, I don't want to have to learn everything there is to know about open telemetry and metrics and logging and tracing. I just want to know why my database is slow. And so my advice to you is to not worry about it right now and use a vendor like AppOptics, which supports automatic instrumentation. And so in this query example, uh, what this is pseudocode, but whatever, if you're using um, C Sharp, Java, JavaScript, PHP, Python, or Ruby, we've got fully, or Scala, we've got fully automatic distributed tracing. And um, basically, we will measure for you all your database performance and give you this picture of which inbound requests and what types of transactions are causing that performance. And this is based on nearly 10 years of experience since Tracelytics days of tracing pr production workloads. The instrumentation we've got is, is uh, well tested in production and automatically captures requests throughput latency and error rates. We provide an SDK that you can use to report custom spans and application metrics and counters, as well as a logging integration with Logly and PaperTrail that involves uh, trace IDs that are automatically injected into logs if you enable that feature, as well as um, browser performance from the point of view or browser uptime checks and synthetic browser integration from the Pingdom side all the way down to uh, traces on the Hypoptics side. Uh, excuse me, Chris. Uh, I miss the correlation between uh, the open source project and your mm -hmm. product. Sorry, maybe, maybe I have. Right. So yeah, I think that the point I was trying to make is that um, since open tracing and open census and open telemetry were all announced, there's been a sort of um, a continual uh, march towards this goal of unified uh, telemetry metrics, logging metrics, and tracing SDKs. Um, to date, it hasn't yet come true. The, the open telemetry is still in beta as of uh, last month and um, only has partial support for a set of uh, a small set of languages, Go, Java, JavaScript, and Python, and Erlang. And so the, the, in the future, I think we're going to be hearing a lot more from this, this open source community. And as a lot of vendors have been starting to participate with open telemetry, including SolarWinds, there is an increasing amount of activity where the open source world is going to be able to supply a lot of out of the box features. But today that isn't true. And um, because there's such a large surface area, this is, uh, this is kind of an in development process. And so, you know, for starting from open tracing in 2015 to open census in 2018 and now open telemetry, which has merged the two, you're still not going to get that kind of out of the box, fully automatic um, behavior unless you're willing. And, and today, really, all you've got is a set of beta instrumentation libraries for a small set of languages that give you that require you to do a lot of the same work to, you know, manually instrument, manually count, and manually log exactly what you want to see showing up in your in your you vendor measurement system. Over time, you know, exactly your APIs with there, so you know the uh, there is yeah. less in for, for your customer or vice versa. I mean, uh, an open telemetry developer can migrate to your solution by changing. Exactly, it. yeah. And we're definitely going to be there when everything is, is ready. Um, but to date, I don't think this is, um, well, you could just go to the Open Telemetry website and it says it's not ready for production, right? This is this is an in-development project. And I think there's a lot of enthusiasm in the open source community around these common APIs and ways of providing common framework and making it so there's not so much duplicate work across the open source world. but. Um, that's it's kind of a long hard slog to get to there and once we're there I think it'll be it'll make it a much more convenient to write the kinds of code that I was demoing in all of these examples this is going to be a much simpler process but at the moment I would say your best bet is to use um, something that gives you a lot of those features out of the box and then once that open source world is ready to integrate with vendors like ours we'll we'll all be able to work together and provide a good experience with with, with everyone um, for example if a library author is integrating with open telemetry that'll just sort of seamlessly show up in vendors um, uh, trace pages and, and APM dashboards, you'll, you'll get the benefit of both worlds where uh, library authors will work in tandem with open telemetry and the, and the vendor commercial and open source community and having this one sort of consistent measurement um, instrumentation base. So that was just a kind of a preview of um, what's been going on in that sort of 
open source standardization world versus the um, the commercial vendor world and how they're all starting to work together. And this is a, there's been a lot of enthusiasm and excitement, including from myself. But um, today, if you don't want to do any work in seven languages and just get out of the box to check your tracing metrics and then some way to report your own custom data, this is, you know, I think AppOptix is still providing a, a very... Um, a very complete approach to how to get this working across a whole bunch of different environments and stacks.